Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. Last week, we were talking about faith and where faith begins. And we were talking about faith begins where the will of God is known. And we ended on Friday's broadcast talking about knowing the will of God. You know, some people think that we cannot know the will of God. And we already covered many scriptures that show us that God gave us the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the ways of God and the will of God and even the plans and the purposes of God. And so we saw also that not only can we know the will of God, but also the scripture tells us or commands us to know God's will. The Bible commands us to know God's will. For example, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this is telling us, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test, approve, you can say, know what God's will is. Now, he is telling us that we must know what God's will is. Also, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Ephesians five seventeen says, Therefore, Do not be foolish. Again, it's a command. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So it's a command that we are supposed to understand what the Lord's will is. We must understand what the Lord's will is. And then also in Colossians chapter one, verse nine, it says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So you see, again, Paul was saying that we are supposed to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. So it is a wrong thinking that many Christians, even millions of Christians have, thinking that we cannot know the will of God. Not only can we, but we must. We are commanded to know the will of God. Now, some people talk about, well, shouldn't I pray, Lord, if it be thy will? And then they will make reference to the scripture where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he was crucified. And he said, Father, take this cup from my hands, yet not my will, but yours be done. If it be your will, take this cup from my hands. Well, let's talk about that just a moment. There are different kinds of prayer. There are different kinds of prayer. And we must understand different kinds of prayer because different kinds of prayer have different rules or guidelines. One kind of prayer is the prayer of consecration. Prayer of consecration. That's where you dedicate yourself and consecrate yourself to God. And in that prayer of consecration, you are saying to the Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That is the prayer of consecration and dedication. And in that prayer, you do pray, Lord, your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Then there is the prayer of faith. 
the prayer of faith is a prayer of confidence. And as we said before, the word if, if it be your will, that is a statement of question and doubt. And as we read in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. You see, the prayer of faith is supposed to be a prayer of confidence. And therefore, in order to pray the prayer of faith, you must first find the will of God. As we said last week, faith begins by knowing the will of God. So what that means is you are not ready to pray the prayer of faith until you know God's will. You are not ready to pray the prayer of faith until you know God's will. If you don't know his will, then you cannot pray the prayer of faith. You can pray to know his will. But you cannot pray the prayer of faith. And so there are two ways to know the will of God. One is by the written word of God. The written word of God is God's will. Even we call it Old and New Testament. Well, it is God's last will and testament. The Bible is God's will and testament for our lives. And so God's word is his will. Then for different things, a lot of things we can find in his word and we will know his will for our lives because of what he has already said in his word. There are other things that are not in the Bible, that the other way we must know his will is by the Holy Spirit. And as we, we talked about this also on Friday, that the Holy Spirit is given to us, Jesus said in John 14 and John 16, to teach us all things, to guide us into all truth. First Corinthians 2 says that he is to reveal to us the thoughts of God. So one way we know the will of God is by the word of God. Anything that is in the word, you don't have to ask about. If it's written in the word, you don't ask about it. It's already declared and it is final. God is not going to change it. But there are things in our lives that are not in the word and those things will be taught to us by the Holy Spirit. Things such as you're asking God, should I move to Texas? Should I go to this or that university? Should I go on the next mission trip to Africa? God, do you want me to do this? And that area of asking God's will is usually always related to things that we are to do in life. Places we go, things we do. And we ask God, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go here? Should I go there? And then you ask God's will. But let's take, for example, you're asking God, your church is having a mission trip to Kenya. And you want to know, if it is God's will that you should go on the mission trip to Kenya. Well, before you can have faith for the money to go, because let's say they're going to say it's going to cost $2,000 and you don't have the money. Well, before you can have faith to claim $2,000 to go on the mission trip, 
You have to find out if it is God's will. And so you first pray, Lord, is it your will for me to go on this mission trip? And you will know that it won't be in the Bible. You're not going to go open the Bible and find where it says, John, go on the mission trip to Kenya. It's not in the Bible. So how do you know? You know it by the Holy Spirit telling you. And this will be another one of our subjects. It's even one of the laws of the kingdom that we will talk about in the future about how to know God's voice, how to be led by the Holy Spirit. It is so important and it's especially important for knowing God's will for your life, whether you're supposed to go to this university or that university, whether you're supposed to take this job or that job, whether you should live in this city or that city, if you should marry this person or if you should marry that person, all of the things that we do in life, we have to know by the Holy Spirit if it is God's will. So before you can actually claim something in faith, you have to know it is God's will. So, for example, before you can claim $2,000 to go to Kenya, you have to know it is God's will for you to go to Kenya. Before you can pray the prayer of faith to claim a, uh, a certain promotion or a job or the money to move somewhere, You have to know that it is God's will. So therefore, you cannot have faith to claim something until you know that it is God's will. So therefore, you must pray to know the will of God before you can pray the prayer of faith. And when you know the the will of God, that is the beginning of your faith. Because now you know that God wants you to go. You've heard from God. That gives you faith. For example, when you know that God said, yes, you are to go on the next mission to Kenya. Yes, go to Kenya. Then that has given you a basis for faith. So that now you can pray the prayer of faith, which claims the $2,000 that you need to go to Kenya. So let me say, say it like this. We have no basis for faith unless God has made a promise or given direction. Let me say that again. We have no basis for faith unless God has made a promise or given direction. Let me say it like this. You have no faith that I am going to come over to your house and, and shovel snow out of your driveway. Unless I have told you I'm going to come over to your house and shovel the snow out of your driveway. Or, for example, you don't have any faith that I'm going to give you $100 unless I have told you I am going to give you $100. So you see, there is no basis for faith or confidence until something has been promised. Or directed if God is saying, do this, do that. So you see, now we're talking about faith begins with where the will of God is known or begins by knowing the will of God. But now let's step on to this next statement. Faith comes by hearing God's word. Faith comes by Hearing God's word. Now, God's word is given to you in written form in the Bible. So anything that is written, any promise that is written or any command that is written 
gives you the basis for faith to claim what is promised or commanded. For example, when God said in Ephesians 5, 17, understand what the Lord's will is. Now that becomes your basis of faith, your grounds for faith to believe that you can and will understand the Lord's will because God has said so God's word becomes the grounds, the foundation for your faith because God has spoken it. God either has promised it or directed it. So we find God's will in his word. His word is his will and testament. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to say something else about knowing the will of God. Anything that the Bible has promised or commanded, you should not ask God if it's his will for you to have it or do it. Let me say it again. Anything that God's word has promised or commanded, you should not ask God if it is his will for you to have it or do it. Why? He has already spoken it. He has already promised it or commanded it. Therefore, you don't ask. Let me give you a list of things. For example, anything that Jesus redeemed us from on the cross, anything that Jesus died for on the cross, anything Jesus carried on the cross, anything Jesus suffered in his beatings and crucifixion, death and burial, anything Jesus suffered, carried, you should not carry or suffer. Hallelujah. Jesus did it for you. You see, Jesus was our substitute. And if he was our substitute, then that means he took our place instead of us. So what good would it be for him to have suffered something for us? And then we should still suffer it also. You see, that would make his suffering in vain. His death would have been in vain if he died for us. And then we also die if he bore it for us. And then we also bear it. Then it would mean that his sufferings and his death were all in vain. No, anything that Jesus suffered in his crucifixion and death and burial, we should not suffer. We are redeemed from these things. Now, let me give you a list of things and I'll give you scriptures. These are things that are in the Bible that you already know the will of God concerning because it's already written. For example, Jesus died for us. Second Corinthians 515 to make us alive. Ephesians 2, 5 and Acts 17, 28. Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness. Isaiah 53 verses 5 and 12 and second Corinthians 521 in order to make us righteous with his righteousness. Second Corinthians 521. Jesus was rejected. Isaiah 53 3 in order to make us accepted. Romans 15 7. Jesus was alone and forsaken. Matthew 27 46. So that we would never be alone or forsaken. Hebrews 13, 5. 
Jesus suffered shame. Hebrews 12, 2, in order to give us glory. Romans 9, 23 and 24 and 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Jesus was condemned. Mark 14, 64 and Romans 8, 3 in order to justify us. Romans 5, 9. He became the curse. Galatians 3, 13 in order to give us the blessing of Abraham, Galatians 3, 14. Jesus was bound, Matthew 27, 2, in order to set us free, John 8, 36, and Galatians 5, 1. Jesus bore our sicknesses, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, and Matthew eight seventeen. In order to make us healed, Isaiah fifty three five and first Peter two twenty four. Jesus carried our griefs and sorrows, Isaiah fifty three four, in order to give us joy, John fifteen eleven. Jesus became poor, Second Corinthians eight nine, in order to make us rich, Second Corinthians eight nine. And 2 Corinthians 9, 11. Jesus went to hell, Acts 2, 27, in order to take us to heaven, John 14, 3, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. That's just a short list. He died to make us alive. He was made sin to make us righteous. He was rejected to make us accepted. He was alone and forsaken that we would never be alone. He suffered shame in order to give us glory. He was condemned in order to justify us. He was bound so to, in order to make us free. He was made the curse in order to give us the blessing. He bore our sickness in order to make us healed. He became poor in order to make us rich. And he went to hell in order to take us to heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now that will preach. So you see, all of those things I've given you scriptures for, they are already written in the Bible. Therefore, you should be made alive. You should accept and have faith for righteousness. Have faith for justification. Have faith for the blessing. Have faith for healing. Have faith to be made rich. Hallelujah. Have faith to go to heaven. Why? Because it is already promised. Any Thing that is promised in the word of God is God's will for you. Anything Jesus bore on the cross was to redeem you from it and give you victory over it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So how do you know the will of God? By the written word and by the Holy Spirit. Now, faith comes by hearing the word of God. When I tell you I'm going to do something that then gives you faith to receive it. When God tells you he's going to give you something that is the beginning then of having faith to receive it. Now, how do you get your faith to grow? You get your faith to grow on the word of God. Hallelujah. Just in the same in the natural, when your muscles and your body needs to grow, how do you get your body to grow? Two things. You feed it and exercise it. Feed it and exercise it. So start by feeding your faith. You need to feed your faith. Little food then there will be little faith. Remember, we talked about little faith, great faith, that a little faith will bring a little change. Great faith can bring great change. Remember, Jesus told the disciples, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Why were you so afraid? But he said to the centurion, you of great faith, I have not seen such great faith in all Israel. Why did the Roman centurion have great faith? Because he said to Jesus, simply say the word only and it'll be done. He believed it without any previous 
proof or evidence. He knew confidently that when God spoke it, when Jesus spoke it, it would happen. No prior evidence or proof was necessary. He said, say it, it'll be done. That was great faith. Now you also can have great faith when you can say, Lord, your word is true. What you've said is true. Just I take it. It's done. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So your faith can be, can grow by feeding on the word of God. You need to feed your faith. How? By meditating the promises of God. Now, as I've said before, on my website, www.victorious, that's V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, faith, F-A-I-T-H dot C-O, victoriousfaith.co, go to my page called Help from God's Word and find scripture promises. If you need help getting promises for your faith, go to there, go to that page and get promises, meditate on those promises day and night so that it feeds your faith. Your faith needs faith food. The word of God is your faith food. Hallelujah. Also, you can write to me at P.O. Box 1418, Castle Rock, Colorado, 80104. Now, join me again tomorrow. Remember, God loves you. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.